Please be seated. Hello and welcome to Highland Country Fellowship. Happy July 21st. I'm sure it's a celebration somewhere, right? It was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Um, I remember where I was when that happened. Yesterday I was recalling it fondly, and I think Sammy was on one of the engineering teams that uh, put that together back in 1969, so we owe him a great debt of thanks there. Hey, if we have not yet met, my name is Bill Rector. I'm delighted to be the teaching pastor here at Highland Country Fellowship. I noticed some people just visiting and some new people. It's wonderful to see you. I hope you'll give me a chance to shake your hand. I'll, you'll find me out there in a conspicuous shirt in the lobby on your way out. And I'd love to say hello, and I hope... I hope that when you're here, you notice three things about this church that we, we happen to love that are just distinctive. First of all, these are the friendliest people on earth. They turn an ordinary gathering into Christian loving fellowship, and you do that. Thank you. Whatever kind of mood I'm in, I walk in here and I'm up because I have to be. I don't have any choice. You guys have that effect, and it's wonderful. It really is. It, it's palpable. Uh, and then we have these worship leaders. Oh, they're gifted musicians, all of them, but they are worship leaders, make no mistake, because they turn that fellowship, suddenly we're having all kinds of fun, and then the next thing you know it, we've turned it and transformed it into worship in the throne room of God. Amen? That's a gift, and they share it with us every week. And while we're in the throne room of God, the third thing that is distinctive is we, we unleash his ideas, word by word, verse by verse. Buckle up, get ready, God's word is coming at you, right? Whether you like it or not. And that's what we do here. And that's my privilege and my pleasure to have that part in it. So I want to get right to that. We are in the Gospel of Luke. We are taking on one of the most amazing parables in all of Jesus' ministry today. We're going to start it at least today. Uh, It is in the Gospel of Luke, and it is in chapter 20, and it begins in verse 9. I think we may have it so you can follow along. If you have your Bibles and want to follow along, it goes like this. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent, a, uh, he sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. The owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, may this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and said, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests look for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them but they were afraid of the people. And this, beloved, is the word of the Lord, and the mouth of the Lord has spoken it to you, his beloved people. Uh, the, what, you know, it's funny. I guess if you ask me what's my favorite parable of Jesus, it's probably whichever one we happen to be studying, okay? But this might be up there. This is one of the most complicated, and it demonstrates the genius of God, the character of God, it, this is really an amazing parable. The title of this is The Parable of the Vineyard, Part 1. And I say Part 1 because I'm afraid there will be at least a Part 2. How's that? Uh, and, and I hope to show you just how intricate this parable is, how many subtle, hidden meanings are there, how, how, how much it demonstrates the real genius of our Lord. Uh, just think of it this way. This parable begins in the history of Israel, Jesus brings it to the present with him in the present day and then projects it into the future. 
And it, it, be, it begins with a historic thing, and then it ends with something that is as much prophecy as any other uh, prophecy in the Bible. So as we get into this, uh, I'm looking forward to telling you, and I think we better start with, with where we are in terms of Jesus' ministry. Where he is speaking this parable, he is in the temple, he's in Jerusalem, and he's in the last week of his life, his first coming, okay? Let's make that clear. But Jesus is two or three days away from going to the cross when he does this. All of his life, all of his ministry has led to this culmination. He has been planning to bring himself to that moment at that place in time. And he, and he knows that's what's going to happen. He is in Jerusalem by choice. He's in the temple by choice, although he knows it will end in his death. Jesus does not fear death. He has actually come to give his life as a ransom for many, and I pray that you are among those. Uh, it, but, but he is planning that to coincide on Friday afternoon of that week with the sacrifice of the Passover lambs so that the significance of his sacrifice would be lost on no one. So he is in the temple where he has opposition that comes from Pharisees and chief priests and scribes and teachers of the law. And we, we hear about these people. And why is it they're opposed to them? Because they've laid out a specific course of things you must do to be right with God. And if you do them, and if you do this, and if you do these 68 things, you will be right with God. And Jesus said, no, I, that's, it's not about what you do. It's about your relationship. Because you can't do ever enough to make yourself right with God, but you can be right with him by becoming his child, by becoming adopted by him, by a relationship with him where you acknowledge and that's so antithetical. And if you're new to Christianity, this is really difficult for people to understand. So I don't have to do anything. No, you can't. You can't. There's no amount of good works or heroic deeds that could ever save your soul. If there was, then we, we would be made by God to do those, and Jesus Christ would not have had to have died for us. Amen? So there's nothing we must simply receive but that receipt requires an acknowledgement that he is God and he is who he said he is. This was a huge conflict in the temple between the existing leaders and the existing power structure. If you get to tell people all the rules of what they have to do to go to heaven, that's better than writing the tax code, isn't it? <laughs> you think about that for a minute. Uh, the, he was undermining their power base politically and they wanted nothing to do with it. They had to discredit him. They were already planning to kill him. We learned that from chapter 19 and even farther back than that. They had to discredit him and kill him, but they were afraid of the people because Jesus spoke and he taught. And while he was there that week, Luke tells us that he taught in the temple and that he taught with authority. And the root word of authority is author. I will challenge you, if you are a skeptic or you're an agnostic or you just don't know, read a few chapters of the Gospel of John. Read it in a quiet place with an open mind. See if a divine presence doesn't come out of that book that could not have been written by a man or a woman or a group of men and women. This is the ideas of God, and that's what Jesus claimed to represent. And when he spoke like E.F. Hutton. <laughs> People listen, right? That dates me a little bit, doesn't it? Okay, you explain it to the younger people here. <laughs> so he had come into Jerusalem that week riding on a donkey, and that was a symbol that he was a king offering peace. And there was praise and shouts from people, and the, these religious leaders didn't like that. They said, rebuke your disciples. He said, are you kidding me? They know I'm God. And if they were quiet... The rocks know that I created them, and they would cry out. And these, these Pharisees are like, they're almost swooning. But that, that, didn't, that didn't get any better, because the day after that, he goes in and he cleanses out the temple. He gets rid of the animal merchants. He gets rid of the loan sharks and the money lenders and the scammers. And they were not only a corruption of the temple proper, taking up space that was supposed to be used for something else, they represented the corruption of these chief priests that were really in it for the money. And he drove them out. And then last week we heard about them questioning his 
authority. They asked him, you know, by what authority do you do this? And really what you hear them asking is, who do you think you are coming here and doing this? And see, the, the Bible tells us that they wanted to kill him. They're angry enough after he's cut into their business that they're ready to kill him, and yet they're afraid of the people. So they ask him. And, and I, think, I think we said we can condense all of that first exchange into something like they ask him, who do you think you are? And he says, well, I don't know. Who do you think I am? And I'll give you a hint. Who did you think John the Baptist was? And they can't answer. So they said, well, we don't know. And he says, well, then I'm not going to tell you. And that was the first eight, ch- eight verses of chapter 20. It really was. I, I made that last a half an hour last week, and I still didn't, I didn't get lynched or ridden out of town or anything. But it's, that's really what that was. And, and, and then Luke says now, in verse 9, that he went on to tell a parable. That could mean that he did that immediately after, or not too far after, but his audience has changed. Instead of interacting directly with his opponents, now he's teaching a parable to the people. All right, so this is where we are. And he starts what may be the most interesting parallel that Jesus ever told. Verse 9, he went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. And the brevity of Luke is amazing here. Because he's just setting up something that if you were a Jewish person hearing this in the first century, this would have evoked all kinds of patriotic images. I mean, there's no way you would have heard this anywhere without thinking about the history of your country, right? Uh, it, it, and let me, I want to trace that back for you a little bit. And I'm sorry, this might, this might be a little long, but it's, it's really important we understand how steeped their culture was in this image of the vineyard. That's really, we're going to take that vineyard apart this week. Mark and Matthew tell the same parable at the same time. And there's, if you read them all side by side by side, there's not much difference between the two. But occasionally, there's a couple of little things. Mark and also Matthew add in a few things. This opening line is told by Mark, says this in Mark verse, chapter 12, verse 1. He then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, he put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. Well, that's the same story, isn't it? But there's some details added, right? Did you catch that? There's a wine press in there. That's nice, especially if you like wine. There's a watchtower in there, which is nice, especially if you like Jimi Hendrix, right? <laughs> Just want to know who's here. I'm just trying to figure out what the age of my audience a little bit. Okay, and I'm getting a thumbs up from the dentist back there. I'm, I, I got you. All right? So he's put a watchtower, and, then, and he's put a, a, a wall around it. And what's, why, what's the difference there? Is Luke omitting those things on purpose? Well, I don't know. I mean, Luke, they're all inspired by the Holy Spirit, by my belief. I think Luke is just thinking, nobody's going to miss this reference. But I think Matthew and Mark want to explicitly tie this to the definitive reference to Israel as a vineyard, which comes from Isaiah. Okay? So let's go all the way back. And again, I'm sure Luke is thinking, nobody's going to miss this. And Matthew and Mark, guided by the Holy Spirit, says, well, let's make it really clear. So Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. This is the beginning of this whole motif. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. He then looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Okay, so this is the story. And, and now you catch why that reference to the watchtower and the wine press are there, right? This is an unmistakable linkage to this verse. But there's a little problem here, and it's that last thing. It, they looked for good graves, but it yielded only bad fruit. Wait a minute, I thought, I thought this was a story of national pride. Let's keep going for a minute here. Verse 3, Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge 
and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. Wow. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. And they, this was the definitive metaphor of Israel. So why is, why is it that anybody hearing that wouldn't, isn't that a bad thing? Well, remember now, that happened. Isaiah prophesied that this would happen to Israel six to seven hundred years before people were hearing this in Jesus' day. And according to their history, that already happened. All those bad things happened, and they recovered from it. So they hear this Isaiah story like we would hear stories about the Civil War. It would be almost if, if I began a speech on Founders Day or the 4th of July with four score and seven years ago. Right? You, as an American, you'd be thinking, oh, this is going to be one of those good American speeches. But really, four score, that's the Gettysburg Address. That was given in the middle of the most turbulent conflict in our country's history. Oh, and we, we've got a few that they make it look like are bad today. But, you know, between five and 600,000 Americans died. There's nothing close to that. So how could that inspire? Because we've moved on from it. And that's what they're thinking as well. This metaphor about the vineyard, that's how we were planted. We were planted by God. And we had our troubles, and God had to discipline us, but now, 600 years later, look, we're still blessed of God. Does that make sense? And so steeped in this, this is just soaked throughout the Old Testament. And I'm going to try and go quickly through these, but I'm just stunned if you look for this. You will start to see these vineyard references everywhere. Later in Isaiah... Right When things get a little bit better, and he's prophesying about what will happen in the end, he, Isaiah 27 says this, In that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. And there we are. We're back in the vineyard. Psalm 80 talks about this. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out nations and planted it. That's Israel. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root, and it filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea. It shoots as far as the river. You, you, you getting this? I got a couple more, just because that's what I want to do. I like Ezekiel 19 is my favorite. Your mother was like a vine. This is a your mother joke contest here. Your mother was like a vine, Right? Uh, it was like a vine in your vineyard planted by the water. It was fruitful, and its branches, because of the abundant water, its branches were strong, fit for a ruler's scepter. It towered high above the thick foliage, conspicuous for its height and for its many branches. In other words, <laughs> this vine that I'm growing out of Israel is conspicuous, means People see it and they think, my gosh, that's a big plant. I wonder why that one's so big compared to all the others. It's conspicuous, like my shirts, <laughs> right? Well, not, not this one compared to some of you. But. Hosea chapter 10. Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars in his land, prospered. He adorned his sacred stones. Can I, let me stop here. I hope you get the idea. This was absolutely ingrained in the culture of the people. The minute I say, uh, start to tell a story about a vineyard, oh, that's us, right? The national imagery would have just swarmed around them. And, and probably it would have been a good-natured thing. Oh, good. It's a, one of those old familiar tales about our country. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. First part of verse 10. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. Make sense? You know, I'll tell you what. This is tenant farming. Uh, you, you may know about this. I know something about tenant farming because I'm from rural Iowa, right? This was done thousands of years, and it's still done today. And just in case you've lived your whole life in the big city of Des Moines, I will, I will tell you what, what this is is that if you own the land... You might allow someone to farm on it. 
And it wouldn't be free. It would either be for rental or for really what it would be would be, hey, you know, if you're just getting started, you can farm this section of my land because I don't want to. I don't need that much. But it's better for me that someone is farming it that keeps the animals away, that keeps the weeds away. You living on it protects it. It helps develop the fertility of the land. So it's good for me that you do this. I'll help you with the seed. I'll let you use my equipment. I just want to share the crop. And by the way, to this day, sometimes these people are called sharecroppers, right? And without, without this kind of technique, land across America, you know, the whole state of Kansas it would never have been farmed without something like this. And now, it, you know, Kansas feeds like 500 times its population because of these kinds of techniques. So this is what he's talking about. I'll get some tenants to farm this for me because I'm going to be away, right? And uh, at harvest time, I'll, I'll send some people back. Now, the, the idea of at harvest time, I, got, I need to take a little detour here because the idea is not so much that this guy was, uh, made this deal with them in May and he's come back in November. He went away for a long time. In, in Matthew and Mark, it says he went away for a long journey. The implication here is years, years he was gone. And something about this is absolutely biblical, and it's a lesson, and it reminded me of something that I used to do. Remember, I used to teach. I worked with young people. I was a math teacher. And every now and then, parents would come in. I, I don't know if you can believe this or not, but they would come in with their student that was struggling with Ds and Cs in math, and they would hope that after one tutoring session that they'd get an A. Right? I mean, this is the, the eternal hope of parents, not to mention the drive-through culture that we live in. Can we do some McTutoring and we'll turn that D into an A, right? Well, it takes time. And so uh, one, one of the things I would point out to them is a verse, one of my favorites, from Leviticus. And I know your Bible study takes you through Leviticus a lot, just naturally. But in Leviticus 19, verse 23... When you enter the land and plant any kind of fruit tree, regard its fruit as forbidden. For three years you are to consider it forbidden. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all its fruit will be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit. In this way, your harvest will be increased. Now, I don't know if any of you understand have vines or fruit trees. I have a little of experience with this. So I can tell you, horticulturally, this is correct. Sometimes trees spend the first few years of their life, sometimes many years of their life, building a root structure deep that will allow them to produce fruit. And all the growth in that tree for those early years is unseen underground. Okay, And I, there's a beautiful spiritual metaphor there. I hope you're not missing it. Um, I got a picture here that this is an exaggeration, but it's not much of an exaggeration. A healthy apple tree will have equal amounts of mass below the surface of root as it has above the surface of wood and branches. I didn't know if you knew that. But in these storms like what we have, they don't blow over because that's the root structure. So imagine the first few years, what Leviticus is telling us, let that grow. You won't see the growth. Right? This is what I used to tell the parents. You know, you're, you're a 14-year-old, and you're wanting to, to obey like a 25-year-old. You're going to have to give him time. And you're, you've got him on the right course, but a lot of his growth is below the surface. You're, you're not going to see it. You're going to have to be patient with it. And I, I hope that makes sense to you, because spiritually speaking, we are the same way. Christ enters our, our, our life. We begin to flow new life in us. And we expect sometimes fruit too early in that process. Maybe sometimes from each other, and maybe sometimes from ourselves. I just want to tell you an example from the Bible. Saul of Tarsus, persecutor of Christians, on his way to persecute more Christians on the road to Damascus, Jesus himself stops him, blinds him, and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And from that moment on, his life was never the same. Saul was transformed to Paul. And Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Most of us here that were not born Jewish or became Christians in those early years of the church, and that's just about everybody in this room, I'm guessing, owe our salvation tracing back its roots to Paul. 
But I need to tell you something. This is absolutely, Paul spent at least a decade, by some measures 14 years from that conversion before he ever ministered or preached to anyone. Okay? And what do you suppose he was doing for those 14 years? Recovering from his eyesight, perhaps? No, he was growing, which is what we need to do. And we're expecting growth to be too fast in our culture. Give the Lord time. Stay in him. Give your children time to grow. Give yourself time to grow. Amen? Okay, we are, I'm going to cut a little bit to the chase here. Spoiler alerts. We're the tenants of the vineyard that he's given us. And every one of us is a tenant, at least of the vineyard of the spirit being that you are. God has placed you to be tenants over that vineyard. And it's a beautiful vineyard. It's knit together in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully so. Made by God, flowing with life that cannot be made in a test tube. God alone gives life, and you are the steward of one. You're the keeper of a vineyard, okay? Give yourself time to grow, but understand that God eventually does want some fruit from there, right? He has the right to all of it. Does he not? He doesn't want it all. He just wants a share. He just wants a share. So, I I had to take that little spiritual detour as we talk about growth. Jesus, now back to his parable in verse 10. The man planted the vineyard. The harvest time, they sent someone to get some of the fruit. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And this is a shocking thing. You know, is it... Jesus' parables, all his best parables, have a little shock and awe value in them. And right here, this would have been, oh, gosh, we were really hoping that we could have recounted the, na- the history of our nation without talking about this part. Well, what part is that? Well, let's just make sure we understand. I don't mean to condescend, but let's make sure we understand the metaphor here. Right? God is the owner of the vineyard. Okay? And the, the nation of Israel up till now has been the tenants of the vineyard. And when the Lord sent a servant to get some of the harvest, those were the Old Testament prophets. And unfortunately, the people in Israel had to live with the fact that over their history, remember this is a huge, this is a 4,000-year-old history. You know, our nation is not only not 250 years old, and we got skeletons in our closet, don't we? Can you imagine? This is a nation that is 4,000 years old. At the time of Jesus, oh, it was only 2,000 years old. So they knew that in the past of their nation, they had had a Babylonian captivity, and they had had prophets that had been sent to them dozens of times that were mistreated by the people. And I, 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 I almost hasten to go through this with you, but there's some examples of this I want to show. I mean, They would have known this too. And part of their problem is how do we square that in our history God has sent us prophets and we've just, we've really behaved badly with them. Let me real quickly do this because there's so many Old Testament. In 1 Kings 18, this is when Elijah's getting ready to have the showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And he meets his servant Obadiah and Obadiah says to him, haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? Right? And then he goes on to say, I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, supplied them with food and water. So they, they killed the prophets. Uh, in 1 Kings 22, it's not much better. Micaiah is a prophet, right? He is the one that, this is a funny story, the king says, don't you have a prophet? Yeah, but he never says anything good. I don't like him. Well, we got to hear from him. So they call him and they say, should we go to war? He says, no, you'll all die. See, I told you he never says anything good. And so this other guy, this Zedekiah son of Kenanah, went up and slapped Micaiah in the face. Prophet of God. Worst job description in the world, right? You ever seen that show, Dirty Jobs? You're going through the one ads, Old Testament prophet, just keep moving. (laughs) Worst job, Isaiah walked around naked as part of what God told him to do. Did you ever read about that in Sunday school class? He had to lay on his side for six months and then switch and lay on his other side for six months as an object lesson. Right? I'm, I'm like, how, who signs up for this? And the answer is no one. You're called into it, right? 
You got one prophet who's forbidden to marry. You got another who is told to marry a prostitute and have children with them and call them unloved and unwanted. Right? Great job, isn't it? These people had it terrible. So then the king ordered the next verse. It's kind of funny here. They, he ordered him to be imprisoned and give him nothing but bread and water. You, you know where that comes from, where we give prisoners nothing but bread and water? Now you do. 1 Kings 22, 27. All right? That's what it is. Here's one that Jesus referenced, 2 Chronicles 24. This is Zechariah. And this one is, Jesus even referenced this. He says, this is when it got the absolute worst. The spirit of the God came upon Zechariah, son of Jehoiada, the priest. He stood before the people and said, this is what God says. Why do you disobey the Lord's commands? You will not prosper because you've forsaken the Lord and he has now forsaken you. But they plotted against him and by order of the king, they stoned him to death in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. And we talked about the temple. This would have been near the altar of the temple. They killed him right there. That's bad. Uh, Nehemiah spoke about the, you know, when Nehemiah finally goes back to rebuild the walls of the city, in his prayer of confession to the Lord, he talks about how we killed all the prophets. And they had, all they were doing was admonishing us to come back to you. Jeremiah, we got Nehemiah, we need to have Jeremiah, right? We got to have all the Mayas. Jeremiah got, got locked in prison, and it was a no fun prison. Uh, in, verse, in chapter 37, verses 15, they were angry with Jeremiah, had him beaten and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, which they made into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell of a, in a dungeon where he remained a long time. Okay, so when Jesus tells this parable about the mistreatment of the prophets, the Israeli people are kind of going, yeah, we, we don't like to talk about that. And so how did they square that? And we're going to talk more about this next week. But their belief was that we are going to have to keep this because it's tradition. And we're big on tradition, right? You've seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? You know, they're big on tradition, right? But the way we'll handle this is we will just assume that we now would never do that to those prophets. And that's where it's like, oh, really? Really? And Jesus is going to call them on that. Prophet after prophet, he sent. And back to the parable, verses 11 and 12, Jesus is going to point out, you didn't do this with just one guy. Verse 11, he sent another servant. But that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. So in the parable now, we've had three servants go, all have been killed. And this is reminding the nation of Israel how they treated the prophets. Like I said, worst job description ever. But uh, Mark and Matthew take it a little farther. See, Luke condenses the story because he's like, I, I think they're going to get it after this. But Matthew and Mark point out, after the three in the parable have come and gone, in Mark chapter 12, verse 5, already three have been rejected. And uh, it says this, he sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. So you, you get the idea. There's a lot of prophets that have been sent to collect, to admonish. What are you doing with the vineyard here? And they're all being mistreated and abused. And that's where this parable turns a little bit. In verse 13, at least the first part of it, Jesus says, then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? And I'm reading this, and I hope you're having the same reaction. What do you mean, what shall you do? They've killed everyone you sent. Nuke them! Sorry, it's a little jingoistic of me. But I mean, is, what, why is the owner of this vineyard asking the question? Gee, they've killed some of my better servants. I wonder what I ought to do. It, it really, I hate to say it, this is a dumb question. But, you know, it's not. It actually demonstrates the genius of Jesus. Because what he's doing is he's using a rhetorical device. It, this isn't a real question. But he's getting us to be empathetic with the owner. See, the owner of the vineyard is God, and God is never at a loss for what to do. God is never surprised by human behavior. He's not surprised by anything you or I have ever done, right? Thousands of years, billions of humans, it's fair to say God has seen it all, okay? So God himself is not really asking, what should I do? But Jesus is taking us inside the mind. He wants you to be empathetic with the owner of this vineyard. What shall I do? It's a dramatic device, right? Right? There's another verse in Jeremiah where, where this same question is asked by God through the prophet Jeremiah. 
In chapter 2, verse 21, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound, reliable stock. And here's the question that really doesn't need an answer. It's called a rhetorical question. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt, wild vine? You, you get it? So what should I do with these people? And, and the owner unveils a new strategy. He says, I know. I know what I'll do. I'll send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. And I'm going to tell you, the first time I read this, I'm, I'm outraged. I mean, okay, I'm empathizing with the owner, I get, but why he's putting up with this much disobedience on the part of those tenants, I do not know. Do you? Why is he still worried about trying to earn the respect? Right? That verse says, perhaps they'll respect. Why does he even care if they respect him anymore? Just wipe them out, right? And I think in that is part of the genius of this parable. Because what Jesus has just done is given us an insight into the long-suffering, amazing grace, patient, forgiving nature of God, hasn't he? Because I'm, I, I is way beyond my human standards for obliteration at this point and forgiveness. And God is still trying. And when we cut to the chase here and we realize that I'm like that tenant and for many years, I rejected people that God sent to me to say, hey, you know, there's an owner here. There's a creator behind all this, right? And I know you've been running from it your whole life. And you've been trying to live like an agnostic or just get away with whatever you can get away with and trying to put this thought on the back burner. But you, you realize, and everyone he sent, now I didn't beat anybody and send them home abused or anything like that, but I still rejected the notion. Now, I, I'm no better than these tenants, brothers and sisters. I personally am no better than them. And, and it hits me that God has been so long-suffering with me, and he's been so patient with me, and he didn't have to be. And it's because of his unending love and amazing grace, and I'm so thankful. Amen? Now, I hope you feel the same way. And, 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 and you know, I, I told you this was part one, and we really spent a lot of time on the vineyard We'll pick this up next week, but there's a beautiful application here that I hope that is just obvious to you. And that is this, ven this vineyard metaphor, it didn't stop in the Old Testament. See, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This idea of us being stewards of a vineyard, it, it continues, and we are. We've been given stewards of a vineyard. Your, your, your living body is a vineyard created specially by God, filled with life that no one else can do, and he's given you charge of it. And it, maybe you're not a Christ follower yet. I say yet. <laughs> but it's time. Today's the day to acknowledge that God is God and you're not. That your body is a creation of God that no one else can make, and he's the owner of that vineyard, and you owe him some due. Even if it's simply an acknowledgement that he is God and his son has been sent to you to offer you a chance to reconcile some of the fruit of that vineyard. Hmm? If that's you, and if this is today's the day, please come seek me out. Visit me or call me later. Let's get, I want to pray with you, and I want to show you. I want to help you on a path to get to know the owner of the vineyard because he has great plans for you. Amen? And for the rest of us, maybe some of us, have acknowledged that for a long time, but we've not taken great care of the vineyard. Or maybe we've taken care of some parts of it, but not others real well. That's me. I'll confess it before you, right? I just will remember that as I'm reading this parable, this vineyard meadow didn't die. This metaphor, this vineyard metaphor didn't die. Jesus renewed it the night before he died to pay that penalty that no amount of effort could pay on my behalf. He retold this parable to his disciples in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Pruning isn't any fun either, but it's his vine. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen? Yeah. The instructions are simple, aren't they? Remain, abide in Jesus. Give yourself some slack and time to grow, little Christians. Okay? But always be growing. Be growing by remaining in him. Remaining in his word. Okay? Because this is the place where you can find him when there's no other place you know to find him. Remain in fellowship with his people. Because their light will sometimes help you when you don't have enough of your own. Amen? And remain with him in prayer. At some point today... Close your eyes and say, God, I'm just so thankful that you have given me a chance to be the steward of this vine. Okay? He's going to do all the work. Right? Life comes only from God. We're just stewards for a little while, aren't we? So let that life flow through you like a branch, like a big, conspicuous living branch that causes others to wonder from whence it came. Let's pray together. Father, how grateful we are that you have planted us with care, with loving, with skill, and you've watered us and you've given us life. We thank you for allowing us to enjoy that life that flows through us. No scientist, no man could ever create. That life comes only from you, and we have it now, at least for a time. And Lord Jesus, we hear your words of promise to us and warning to others that we can only retain that life by remaining in you. So Lord, allow us to abide and remain in you. Allow us to go from here in your love and in your name, with your life so evident, so conspicuous, that the world will surely know that you are God, that you are a God that has the power to give life, to heal, and to save. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.